everybody. My name is Mark Hilliard. I'm a master here on the Arcanum. And today we're going to do a uh, cohort hangout. Uh, and we've got uh, a couple members of the cohort with us. And we're going to discuss the zone system for digital photographers. And as you all probably know, the zone system was developed by Ansel Adams a long, long time ago for film. Uh, both film in the camera, film in the developing soup, and the print out of the enlarger all had links into the zone system. Uh, so what do the others have to do besides that in the camera with us? Absolutely nothing. All we're interested in is the zone system as it applies to the digital camera. Um, before you ask, yes, I do use the zone system 100% of the time. It enables me to uh, evaluate the scene, select an exposure, and nail it each and every time. And it's very, very simple. Um, I am going to be putting a video up um, on our group uh, page uh, by a friend of mine who did a video on the zone system for digital. And the first couple of chapters in the video aren't really applicable, but after maybe number two, um, it is very, very good. I highly recommend that you take the time to uh, view it. Uh, please don't share it. Um, I'm not going to make it public in, both in the Arcanum or on YouTube. Um, so you guys are the only ones that are going to get it. Basically, there are two things that we have to understand before we can jump into the zone system. Uh, number one is the meter type built into your camera. And if those of you who are lucky enough to have one, um, maybe I shouldn't use the term lucky. Uh, those of you who are smart enough to have purchased one, more money, oh boy, oh boy. Um, a spot meter, and there are several on the market by several companies. The most advanced is this one. It's from Seaconic. It's called the uh, L758DR. And Pam, for you, this will have special meaning because this will also control the lights in your studio. Okay. Um, One more. So, Yes? Nothing. Oh, okay. Um, so, let's talk about your camera metering system for a minute. Um, all the digital cameras on the market today have three basic types of metering. They have a matrix meter system, which is several metering uh, pixels in your sensor that reads various spots around your image average them together, and then make decision based upon your focus point. You know, as you focus your camera in automatic focus, the camera selects one of those focus points, and then it feeds that data uh, to the exposure system. And it tells it that that's your main subject, and it, then it will make exposure um, decisions based on that and the metering that's uh, taken randomly around the uh, uh, your scene. And it's a very good way uh, to um, meter your scene if you're shooting in the automatic mode. Uh, other than that, it, it gives you very little to no control over the metering or the exposure uh, selected by your camera. Rather, it puts it in the well, it puts it squarely in the lap of this nice little Japanese engineer sitting over in his desk in Tokyo. Uh, he makes the decisions for you. The second type of metering is center weighted. And what it does is it still uses all of the metering points uh, over your entire sensor. Uh, but it applies 75% of the decision weight uh, to a uh, basically a 30 or 25% area in the center of your uh, view. Uh, center of your um, sensor, 
okay, it gives that 75% of the decision. And then the rest of the area around the outskirts, it gives 25%. Um, and it gives you a little bit more control. It's still an average weighted system and uh, it's still pretty much controlled by that engineer and how he programmed the computer inside of your camera. And then the final type of metering in your camera is called spot metering. And most digital cameras allow you to select a single focus point as your metering point. And whatever that focus point lays on in your scene will take a meter read. Now, most of the digital cameras, and I think, in fact, every single one of them, uh, the spot metering area of the uh, screen is about 3%. So it's a rather large circle, but you can still work with that, especially if you're using a zoom or a long telephoto. Um, Commercial handheld meters like this one, these are true one degree spots. Uh, so they take a much smaller meter reading of a much smaller area of your scene. Well, why do we want to do that, you ask? You are asking that question, right? Okay. Um, if you understand the zone metering system, which would take you about three minutes to understand, if you can lay your spot meter on a specific point of the scene and you know where it's supposed to fall within the zone system, then it enables you to lock your exposure regardless of whether you're metering on a bright sky or a dark rock or something in the middle. Um, it, it makes exposure fast, easy, and ultra-reliable. So having said that, um, I am going to share my desktop with you and I'm going to show you some cool stuff. Are you ready? Got a good desktop image there you guys? It's coming to us. Mm -hmm. coming to us. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Alright, let's go to the desktop here and I've got some files hidden away for you guys. It's going to be at the very end because it's, it starts with a Z. There we go. Um, basically, the zone system lays out your exposure from black to black, black black to white white in a series of 10 discrete zones and here they are lay, laid out for you. Um, with zone 0 being as black as black and zone 10 being pure white. Okay, now all of your meters Look at the world as though it was in zone 5, which is 18% gray. Have you guys heard that before? Yes. Okay, so what that means, if you take a meter reading in the snow and you don't dial in some exposure compensation, the image of the snow is going to be uh, moved into zone 5, which is 18% or middle gray, which is this uh, gray right here in the center. And nobody wants their snow gray, right? Uh, so, knowing this, if we take a meter reading of that snow, we know that we want the snow to have a little bit of texture, correct, yet be white. So we're going to move that up uh, to zone 8 or zone 9. And most people are going to move it to zone 8, which is uh, <clears throat> 1, 2, 3 stops. So you're going to dial in plus 3 stops of exposure compensation and take your picture. And as based on the meter reading of that white snow, you're going to get a good overall scene with the snow being white and the dark areas being dark as long as everything falls within the dynamic range of your camera. Are you all following me so far? Sounds good. Uh, Rhonda, Pam? I don't want to leave anybody behind. No, no, no child left behind. Okay. So what this means is you have to get used to seeing the world around you in black and white, right? But yet you say, oh my goodness, I shoot in color. How do I equate 
color into these 10 zones of grayscale. Well, actually, for general digital use, we're only concerned with five of these 10 zones. Zone 5, Zone 4, Zone 3, Zone 6, 7, and 8. Have you all noticed that in your histogram, the histogram is divided into five zones or five stops? Yes. Each of those correspond to these five zones. Okay, now obviously the newer cameras have a much wider dynamic range, so at that point it's safe to think in terms of zone 2 and zone 1, okay, and zone 8 and zone 9. All right, but knowing that your world is seen by your camera's meter as 18% gray, it doesn't care what it's looking at. If you point that meter to the bright white sky, it's going to look at it as though that guy wants that to be gray, and it's going to move right here. This is zone 9 sky. It's going to move it down here to zone 5, and it's going to make it gray. The same thing is true of snow. It, you take a meter reading on the snow, the camera's going to automatically move it to zone 5 because it expects you to know that it's doing that. Okay, and now that you do know that, it opens up an entire world of possibilities. Uh, let me bring up another image for you to look at here real quick. I'm going to bring up a black and white image. Actually, let's load this into Photoshop so we can get a little bit more detail. Okay, and what this is, is this is an image of the groin. Uh, here on Polly's Island. I took this picture uh, probably last year sometime. And what I've done is I have labeled, according to the zone system, different shades of gray and where it falls within the zone system. Now, notice right here, this is zone 5, and it's this area of the ocean beyond the surf that's a darker gray. You see this? If we put our meter directly on any area of the scene that's already at zone 5, the exposure that the meter gives us is perfect. It's dead on. Everything else is going to fall into place. But if I meter on the sky, which we see is zone 5, 6, 7, Okay, if we take the exposure that the meter gives us here, it's going to move the sky darker. It's going to move it down to zone 5. Okay, so knowing this, we can adjust our aperture or our shutter speed to put this right back in to zone 8, or 5, 6, 7, I'm sorry, zone 7. Um, this will enable us to have a perfect exposure every time. And I don't care if you take a meter reading on something that's already zone 5, something that's zone 7. Uh, up here, uh, this is really um, in, in zone 8, in zone 9, okay? Uh, we can go down here into the dark areas, say here's zone uh, 2. Okay, this dark area of the stone here. If we take our meter reading off that area, then we're just automatically know that the camera's going to move that up to gray. It's going to lighten it. But we're just going to dial in minus one, two, three stops of exposure compensation. And the rest of the image is going to fall into perfect exposure. Here's a histogram. This is how this looks, uh, the various zones. Uh, zone 5, 4, 3. Now, as we get down into 2, 1, and 0, and 8, 9, and 10, you see how they're compressed? All right, we're really more interested in the five zones 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Okay? And it is a very, very simple system. But how many of you look at the world in tones of black and white? Probably. I used I used it for white birds and black bears. 
Hey, that works. That works very well. Yeah. Me, me, me. I only see the world in black and white. Yeah. So, Rhonda, this should be very easy, but what do you do when you're looking through the viewfinder at a color image? You know, that you're going to laugh at me, but I don't see color very well. Are you, uh, are you colorblind or you just have a mental block? I'm, I'm blind. Okay. <laughs> I really don't see well at all. All so, right. Um, yeah. Okay, so it's very easy to pick out areas of color brightness and apply those to the black and white zone systems. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you two. I'm showing you the color and the black and white version. Now, I, I know the zone system like the back of my hand. I'm used to using it. I've used it for 40 years. Okay, it's second nature to me. Um, but learning this is so amazingly easy that you can learn this in just 10 minutes. In the color world, this area right here, see this slightly bluer blue here? This is zone 5. And if you measure with your spot meter and your camera right here, the entire rest of the picture is going to fall into place. Okay, as we go brighter to zone 6, all we're going to do is dial in, okay, plus one uh, EV to move this back up to the to the brighter area that it's supposed to be. Because what this is going to do is this is going to the camera is going to make this slightly darker. Well, this is really good if you have a specific area of the image that you must have detail in, okay. And for this shot, for me. It was this piece of wood sticking up out of the surf right here, okay? I measured this, all right? And I, this, of course, the camera gave me a meter reading and exposure based on 18% gray for this piece of wood. And I wanted this to be in zone three, which is dark blacks with visible textures, okay? So what I did is the camera wanted to overexpose this, so I just dialed in minus three stops of EV. Or since I was shooting this as an ultra-long exposure in the ball mode, um, I just took away three stops, okay, to darken that back down. Does that make sense to you? Sounds good. All right. Um, this is really, really very easy. Um, and there are ways in Photoshop to have Photoshop measure these zones. Um, and we're going to go over that because it's not going to help you with determining the exposure. But what it's going to do is it's going to teach you what colors will equate to what zones. Um, medium green when you're taking landscapes. Uh, not grass in the sun, but grass in the shade equates out to zone 5. All right. And the more you practice this, the easier this becomes. Um, let's look at another image. <clears throat> in West Virginia, in the New River Gorge. Um, now, I was not confronted with a color image. Um, I was taking this on a black and white only camera. And the, my whole purpose in setting up the exposure here is I wanted the water to take on a platinum appearance. Okay? Do you think that I've achieved that? Does the water have this platinum sheen to it? Looks close. Yeah. Well, what, I, what I did is I used my, my spot meter, and I measured right here at the top of this rock. See this right here? That is zone five. And everything fell into place. I took a shot, evaluated it, and decided that I needed the water to be slightly darker. Uh, so I, I, with this meter reading, I just dialed in minus one half EV to darken it up a half spot. And then that gave me the, the, the platinum tonality of the water that I was looking for. But yet, look at the wonderful steps of contrasts in, in these trees with the, the variegated lighting that was shining through. 
And that's all was achieved by meter right off the tip of that stone because I knew that stone was in zone 5. Now I could have just as easily have measured right here in this water knowing that I wasn't looking for white white and I wasn't looking for gray but metering off this water and adding a stop and a half moving it up to zone six and a half between six and seven okay and brightening this water up here to give me that platinum look and that would work also um, the, like I said this is so incredibly easy and the real power of it is is that it enables you to get the exposure dead on each and every time okay um, let's look at a color image uh, because this is where you're gonna have your most issues alright your midtone right here you just need to pick out an area of the scene that equates to zone 5. Well, how do you know that it equates to zone 5? Well, that comes with practice. Um, if you don't know what zone 5 looks like, well, then you definitely know what the highlights and the clouds look like. You don't want the clouds blown out either, do you? So you could take a meter reading off of these clouds, knowing that you wanted detail and structure in those clouds, and knowing that the, the, the meter reading is going to make those zone 5, which is gray, move them up to zone 8. So add th plus 3 EV to it. And that one meter re measurement and the setup of the exposure is going to put the whole rest of the picture where it needs to be. Um, very, very easy. Um, here is a, uh, how long was this? This was a 60 second exposure of coquina rocks in Georgetown Harbor out on the end of the, uh, the bay. And the waves were washing in over top of these. Um, the grass, believe it or not, not the bright grass, but the dark grass right here, this is zone 5 and all I had to do was take a meter reading right there and the rest of it came in now obviously I wanted to do a longer exposure but if I place this in zone 5 that gave me the meter reading I wanted alright then I added in um, the adjustment for 6 stops of neutral density or 10 stops of neutral density and chose my shutter speed or I chose my aperture uh, to get a good depth of field and a nice sharpness to the image and I did my uh, zone adjustment using shutter speed and I compensated for the ND filter using my shutter speed so that's how I was able to get down to 60 seconds and this was ultra bright sunlight okay um, so this was this was the uh, the black and white version and as you see this this is definitely definitely in the zone 5 area uh, so it becomes very easy now you could have measured on the water uh, but this water was moving and I wanted to slow it down so it's really difficult to get a good reading off of moving water so you need to be able to do a meter reading off of the rock somewhere this would have this this area here would have also been a very good uh, area to, to do your meter reading all right, so now let's look at another image. If you guys will unmute, this is a typical scene um, here in Polly's Island of one of our salt marshes. But what made this scene different than what I normally see is to see the beams of sunlight going across the sky. Yeah. I wanted to get those beams of sunlight so that I could tell the difference between one beam and another. So my exposure had to be dead on. All right. So what I did is I took my meter reading right here in this brighter area of the sky where the beam was. Okay. And I set that for uh, zone uh, six and a half took my exposure and this is what I got. It took me about five seconds to do the meter reading and to set the, uh, the camera up. Um, it's a very 
very powerful way to control your exposure. And I don't care if you're shooting color, black and white, if you're doing wildlife or vistas, um, HDRs, you got to get one of those images, your zero image, at the right exposure. And this is such an easy way to do it. All right. So, how do you learn what colors equate to what zones, right? Yeah. Um, one of the NIC tools, uh, the Silver Effects Pro, has a zone chart in it. Oh, this is black and white. Hold on a second. God, I hope I just installed a new filter in my Adobe. Did you About, install the right one? Oh, yeah. yeah I, I, I just installed uh, Topaz um, Textures. And I may have killed my filters because of that bug in CS or CC uh, 2015. Let's see here. Oh, there it's going to start up. Okay. Um, if you start up Silver Effects, um, of course it's going to. I'm just going to go into the neutral version of it. But if we go down here to the bottom of the of this little histogram and um, preview window you see the zones being displayed across the bottom here yep if you Got lay it. lay your your mouse on zone 5 it shows you the areas that are zone 5 you see how they're dotted in a red hash yep yeah okay this enables you to see where the zones are now obviously it's still showing us the picture in black and white but we, we just viewed the picture in color, so it's in our mind what areas were what. Okay. So let's go to where the green grass was, the green moss. Um, and it was really dark green, and that's zone two and zone three. Um, there is, no, there's some in zone four, too. So as you see, this is a good way to get a handle on what the zones equate to in color. There's also some very, very good books on the subject. And there's some good videos out there, too. And I'm going to upload. Oh, I've already uploaded a video uh, to YouTube. And it was crunching uh, as we spoke. Um, but a, a good thing to have are these zone charts, okay? And I, I will put these up on our uh, group drive, okay? And like I said, all you need to know is your meter is going to make everything zone 5. That's what the meter sees in. It looks at the world as over 18% gray, and if it's not, it will make it that and when it gives you your exposure. And then it's up to you to shift it darker or lighter, knowing what these zones are. Okay? Like I, I was doing the, the picture here. Let's, let's do that. Uh, let's do these two. Um, I, I metered off the top of this rock right here, and I knew that was going to be zone 5. Okay? Um, I metered off of this area of the water, and I moved it up uh, to zone 7. Because when I meter here, it's going to make that zone 5. It's going to underexpose, it's going to, uh, underexpose it. And what I want is I want it brighter. And, Mark, generally the engineering of all of yes. the camera sensors is still to underexpose highlights. That's, that's how it's inherently programmed, correct? Yes. And if you that that's if you're using the, the matrix metering mode, or if you're using the, the center weighted, a little less so in center weighted. But if you put your camera in spot meter mode, you take total control and the camera's not going to shift anything. Okay. Okay. Now, what's your thoughts on occasionally I notice my blue channel is blown out even though I have a well controlled exposure. Um, you know, that's all very dependent on the scene, on, 
Uh, it's all very dependent upon the, the light source striking your subject and whether you're getting a, a, a blue reflection back into the camera. Okay. Um, infrared, Chris, is the same way. Okay. Uh, if you're shooting, for instance, 590 nanometers, um, you're allowing in visible red light to strike the sensor and you're allowing in infrared light to strike the sensor too, but the infrared light portion is being filtered. So there's a, a two or three stop reduction in that. So that red light poisons the exposure two stops. And you have to always be aware of that and look at your histogram because the red channel is going to be blown out. You really want an equal distribution of the RGB channels. And if the blue channel is burned out, you can use that artistically sometimes, but other times it's going to change the exposure and push it out of the realms where you desire it. Yep, just something I've noticed and been able to control for it. But All right. Let's talk about the two different types of meter systems. Do any of you guys know what they are? What, direct and incandescent? No. Incident. Incident. And and reflected. Uh -huh. um, incident meter reading, that's if you were to take your meter, see this is a, this is a LUMO uh, dome, and if I turn this on and take this out, I'm, you guys are going to take a picture of me, right? I take the meter and I put it right here on my nose, and the meter is going to measure the light falling on it and me at the same time. And you don't do any adjustments for that. You don't do any exposure compensation. You just take the exposure that it gives you and shoot. Well, that's really nice, but a lot of times if you're out of the studio, you can't go out and put this on a mountain three miles away. No? No. Um, I know you've got long arms, Rhonda. You need but, a better um, assistant. Yeah. So you need better assistants that will actually waddle for you. Yeah, or you need a reflective meter. Well, that's what's in camera. Is all that's important. what's in camera, and that's what's in the handheld spot meter. The reflective meter reads the light that hits the scene and bounces back into the camera lens. Now, depending upon where you measure, you're going to get different light because different portions of the scene will reflect the light differently. Um, color affects it, reflectiveness affects it, um, the angle of the light striking the subject affects it. Um, so that's what makes this and the spot meter in your camera so powerful. Rhonda, did we talk about this in Atlanta, the zone metering system? We did, didn't we? Yes, we used the inside of your coat. Okay. All right. Um, have you been practicing it at all, or are you using it? I use it. Good for you, girl. That didn't sound very convincing. Yeah, I, I am looking for a testimonial here, Rhonda. <laughs> well, what I said to you then, and what it still holds true, is that, well, you know, I was kind of lazy, and I was using my camera in auto mode, you know, not auto mode, but AV mode most of the time, or TV mode. But with the Leica, I couldn't get away with that, because it couldn't do a decent exposure. So now Malika and I like each other better because now I've got it in all manual mode and I've, I've figured out that even with the zone system with the metering in that, you need to back off about a half a stop from where you think you want to be, especially on the monochrome or even a full stop because otherwise you always blow your highlights. Yeah. So I don't blow my you highlights. Do you know why that is? No, I have no clue. It's because the Leica doesn't have a spot meter in it. It has a center weighted meter. Oh, well, that explains everything. Okay. Uh, all, all of the Leicas have center weighted. Um, that's what makes these things so, uh, so, so valuable. And they make these big. They make them small. Um, I, I, I've got a little tiny one that's about this big. Yeah. Okay that does both incident and reflective, and it has about a, a two-degree spot built into it. 
Um, it cost about $120. Uh, so they, they are very worthwhile. The next time we're together, I'll let you play with it. I'm that kind of guy. I, I share my toys. Yeah, I have I have one that I purchased. It's a um, it's a Gosson Starlight Two. Mm-hmm. But I really struggle with using it. Mm. Well, the one the, the favorite one was called the the Gosson Luma Pro. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. and the the Gossons are are old. Uh, technology, but they work. I mean, I've got some wonderful old meters that I just love. Mm -hmm. okay. No, I mean, I struggle with, like, the technology of it. It's not intuitive on how to use it, so I need to get the manual out every single time that I pull it out and walk through how to change stuff, because with only two buttons on it, you'd think it would be as easy as an iPad, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I mean, different e different meters have different uh, uh, levels of complexity. Uh, this one frozen. There was a movie about that. <laughs> what well, a nice blue dress! I know. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> It's got an AV mode, a TV <laughs> mode, and a manual mode. Um, this is set in AV mode, and I can take a meter reading and then change the aperture, and it's going to give me the associated shutter speed. I can also dial in up to plus or minus 10 stops of compensation for my ND filters. So I take my meter reading, and then there's a button that I push on it, ISO 1 and ISO 2, and when I do that, uh, what it does is it takes into account, see here, see the, the shutter speed change? Now it's taking into account a six-stop ND filter, and it's just a simple matter of holding a button down and, and rotating the dial um, to generate these different modes of information, and all of the instructions are on the back. Oh, see, that's, that's what you cheap. get for $700. Is the exactly. yeah, they, they sell a very they sell a $300 version of this called a 50 and I bet it doesn't have the instructions mounted on the back. I'm going to just does. laminate mine and tape them to the back and then call it 700. Oh, it does. Um I don't know, can you see in there? Look through the viewfinder. See it it I hold when it you're still. At the spot meter it gives you the data as you're looking through the spot meter. You don't have to turn it around to go to the screen. We see that. Okay, so as I move this around and catch the reflection just right. I didn't know you were supposed to look through it, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I look through it. I aim it. I press the measure button right here. Oh. Okay. And it, it takes the meter reading. Now it does other things too, like it has a dynamic range mode. You push a button and you take a spot meter of the brightest spot and a spot meter of the darkest spot mm -hmm. and then you look on the screen and it tells you the dynamic range of the scene. So you know automatically if you have to shoot HDR or how many HDRs and how far apart they are. Huh. Yes, this is an advanced meter. It's the most advanced one marketed in the world. And it's been out for about eight years. Uh, but it's so good that nobody, they're not going to replace it. Yes, it's new, about $650. Uh, but you can buy them used. Um, they, they come with models to control your studio lights. If I take this off, Pam, see this little gray box here? Mm -hmm. this, this talks wirelessly to studio lights. Do you have studio lights? I have studio lights, but my studio lights are stupid. They don't listen. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Pam, <laughs> it, has a, it has a little plug-in here to plug your studio lights in. Okay, I think I could do that. <laughs> and what that's going to do is you plug your studio lights in, and you turn on the uh, incident 
measurement mode and you walk up to your person you can take a picture of and you put this in front of their face and you push the expose button or the meter reading button and it triggers your flashes okay and then it gives you your exposure just like that and how much did you say that cost well this one this one, one costs about dollars. 650 dollars but the cheap ones even do this Pam even the hundred dollar ones do this but Pam doesn't use studio lights she uses candles she oh, uses yeah. studio lights too I like candles better uh, well see the candles are always on you just go up and you take a meter reading and it's going to tell you what it is I do do that life is good isn't it <laughs> um, so I'm going to put a video on the zone system for digital photographers on our cohort page um, it's probably done now uh, let me go look Um, it's probably done processing on YouTube. I'm not going to make it public. I'm just going to put a direct link to you guys, so only you guys have access to it. Okay. Uh, because That's fine. the uh, the author asked me not to distribute it, other than to those that that are in our group. Oh, you didn't make it. Somebody else made it. No, a friend of mine made it. Oh. And he did a really good job. And there's a lot of nonsense data in there that you won't use. Um, but the second chapter where it talks about the different types of lighting and the different types of metering, uh, that's a good chapter. And then it talks about how to just determine Zone 5 and to do a uh, average meter reading on Zone 5 or to take a, you know, a meter reading on any of the other zones and then shift. Um, there are great books on the, on the zone uh, photography system. You can even buy them for film photography. And all you're interested in is the zone system for in-camera exposure control. Those okay. are the only chapters that you need to read. Okay. Okay. Um, this enables me to do a snap meter reading, get my exposure dead on, and, and take it and go. And it makes it very easy, Chris, um, for doing... Uh, compensation like sh shifting zones uh, picking the, well like your the mountain scene behind you in, in your eye in your avatar here you know uh, well you, you took it away man <laughs> sorry um, you know I, I, I would do a, um, a zone reading on you in the foreground and know that I would get you perfectly exposed and let the mountain fall where it will Okay. I shoot mostly spots, so I got lucky. Dude, you're way ahead of the game then, because very few people shoot spot. Yeah. Okay. The only the only thing that the tip to learn is, you, you know, as you as you move your single point around, you got to remember to bring it to the proper depth of field location, so that you don't mess up your depth of field, especially for the landscape stuff. Yeah, well, that that makes it really easy. You just you you, you just shoot in aperture priority mode, set right. your depth of field, and then move your zone up, or your zone compensation up or down using it uh, exposure compensation. But as you're evaluating the scene, so to speak, you can you know you may pick the sky to see how many stops over is that versus you know a mountain underexposed. So yep. sometimes you forget, you get so excited, you hit the shutter button. <laughs> forget to, well, to it's move digital. it back, and then the front third of your photo is... It, it's digital, so each time you shoot that camera, it's right. kind of free. Um, unfortunately, where the, the issue falls into play is if you're shooting a rapidly changing scene, like a sunrise or a sunset. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there, there, there you want it dead on for every single shot. So you pick your zone, you set your exposure, and you go. And I guarantee you, if you guys start using this, um, almost every single shot you take is going to be dead on, perfectly exposed. But you have to learn to think in terms of the zone system. You know, 
I, I look around me in the house, and I, I know, you know, that the the uh, the the ceiling behind me. Okay, that's really zone six. It's not zone five. The wall over here to this side, that's zone five. That that's mid gray. Okay. Um, the fan blades. See how they're slightly darker than the ceiling. Okay, that that might be zone five and a half. All right, and as you use this more and more, you learn what colors and what brightnesses fall into what zones. And it's only going to take you a few minutes to master this as long as you start using it on a daily basis. Um, reading the books on the zone system is good, um, but I would say let's just watch that video too because he did a, he did a really good job on the video. All right. Sounds good. Um, and knowing that you can determine what areas you're in are in what zone in uh, Silver FX Pro by going down to the bottom and putting your mouse over the zone numbers and, and it will put a red hash over the areas that correspond to that zone. So that helps reinforce you during the learning phase. Okay. Do you all have any questions? Good refresher. You... I liked it. Wanda, can you sing again? Sure. <laughs> Frozen again. Let it go. <laughs> Chris, it's your turn to sing. Okay. Let it go. There you go. <laughs> now, Brandon, your turn. <laughs> Let it go. Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Yes. Thank, thank you. I was about to sing. Well, Brandon, I don't mean to put you on the spot.